Everyone, welcome. I am the president of the HBS Club of Toronto. We are delighted to have you here together with your local clubs, your HBS Club or your Harvard Club. I'm very excited to have Deepak Malhotra here with us. He is a professor of Harvard Business School. Uh, he's an award-winning author of Negotiation Genius and Negotiating the Impossible. He is an advisor to CEOs across the globe and to governments who are trying to negotiate and end various armed conflicts. And in 2020, Deepak launched a new course at Harvard entitled War and Peace, the lessons of history for strategy, leadership, negotiation, policy, and humanity. Also in 2020, Deepak was named Business School Professor of the Year by Poets and Quants. He has won numerous awards for his teaching and for his research, including the HBS Faculty Award, and has been twice selected by Harvard MBA students to give the end of year speech to the graduating class. In fact, folks, you may have seen a one or, or two of these lectures on YouTube, Deepak, they're, they're available uh, on there and they're excellent. So folks, I definitely recommend that you see them. In 2014, Deepak was listed as one of the world's best business school professors under the age of 40. And needless to say, I'm excited and I'm sure you are to have Deepak with us for the session. And then more specifically on the Peacemaker's Code, the debut novel of, uh, of Deepak Mahotra uh, that was published earlier in the year, it, it has the elements of sci-fi, thriller, and drama, while it re-examines human condition and blends in real insights and real learnings. And of course, that's significantly what we're here to talk about and learn from. The main protagonist of the book is Professor Sir Kilmer. He's a renowned historian of war and diplomacy. He, he's collected and he's whisked away. He's taken away from his home to Washington to solve a global crisis. He's thrust into the highest levels of government as an advisor to the president. And, and the young historian must come to terms with the seemingly impossible. He must figure out how to navigate a world where not everything as it appears, and use the skills and the knowledge that he has acquired over his life to help save no less the humanity as a whole and, and prevent humanity from a conflict of truly epic proportions. So it's a gender-breaking novel that re-examines the human condition and masterfully blends some of the most compelling themes in literature. Uh, war and peace, strategy and serendipity, love and friendship, courage and fear, and the bounds of possibility and limits of imagination. So I was excited to read the book. Those of you who are on this, uh, on this call, if you read the book, please chime in in the comments, but without giving away, this is an important part of the logistics of this call, please don't give away, no spoilers, right? We want people to really enjoy it when they read it. And uh, of course, those who haven't, I'm sure you'll want to pick up a book uh, after the conversation. So let's, let's get into the questions and first, uh, a very serious one, Deepak, uh, where I'm just going to beam up the I'm just going to beam up the cover, and so this is Professor Kilmer. And I think everybody wants and needs to know: is he facing us, or are we looking at his back? All right. Well, uh, before I answer that question from from my vantage point, uh, let me just uh, thank you for uh, helping to organize this and even coming up with the idea of doing this session, Boris. Uh, and to the HBS Club of Toronto and to the many other HBS clubs that are involved in spreading the word about this and encouraging their members to join. Uh, I did a quick glance through the participant list. It's, it's long, but I could already see a number of names that I recognize and, and very many that I cannot. And I'm equally thrilled to have both groups represented here. Uh, and my hope is that as we go through the session and go through this hour, not only will we talk about the book specifically and, and why it might be interesting for you, but to give you some takeaway value right from the session. So if you come here, you spend an hour with us and you walk away with nothing other than a book to read, I think for me, that would be less than optimal. My hope is you'll walk away with some ideas that either refresh some thoughts that you've had before, uh, either during your time at HBS or something that might be of standalone value in the work that you do and the life that you're living related to negotiation, strategy, et cetera. Now, having said that, Morris, let, let me answer the question. So uh, I have always considered him to be looking away from us, um, uh, although I believe that at least somewhere between 50 and 65% of people uh, 
this is a rough estimate based on what people will say. They, they think it's maybe looking towards us. And then everybody has all sorts of theories as to why they have to be right. Um, I believe that the correct answer is that there cannot be one right answer in this case. Uh, so it's, it's truly an HBS case discussion. Fantastic. And is as is often the case in negotiations, right, Deepak? You, sometimes there is no perfect answer. What happens, happens, right? And you make the best effort to resolve to the success of the negotiating party, right? But you never know until you take the choice, until you actually make a call and things things play out the way they do, right? That's right. I mean, uh, in the real world, you don't get to live the counterfactual. So you do the best you can. And uh, sometimes there's right and wrong answers, but more often what you're thinking about are better and worse answers given the situation. Uh, so when you're negotiating with someone, um, the reason you think strategically, the, the reason you prepare, and the reason that you go in there having considered a lot of possible ways forward is because at the end of the day, there probably are some that are more likely to lead to success and some that are less likely to lead to success. And that's, that's usually the game you're playing in any human interaction, whether it's a business negotiation or resolving a conflict or anything else. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. And then in terms of Peacemaker's Code, what uh, made you decide to write a fiction novel? And how did you come up with the central ideas of the Peacemaker's Code? So uh, as you mentioned earlier, Boris, last year I launched a course called War and Peace, the lessons of history for strategy, leadership, negotiation, and humanity. Uh, it was sort of a, a, a big promise. And I launched this course uh, in what would have been, I guess, 18 years into being at Harvard Business School, where almost always I had taught negotiations, either to MBAs or to people in executive education. And I love negotiation. It's a big part of uh, how I see the world and, and how I try to contribute to the world. But at some point, uh, it became clear to me that I wanted to write about uh, conflict uh, and war and peace and, and the lessons that we can learn from history. And the original idea was to write a book about things that I had learned through my own research and study, but also the work that I do with governments on armed conflicts. Uh, but then at some point, I realized that that book, whenever it comes out, would be better if I had actually tried to teach this material in, in the classroom, because we learn a lot when we engage with our students, whether it's in case discussions, whether it's, it's you know, uh, having our ideas challenged, uh, learning from the perspective of people that are coming from many different parts of the world. So I announced this course in 2019 for 2020, uh, and a lot of people signed up. And then I realized that I had to create this course because up until then it was literally just, you know, a one paragraph summary of how we're going to cover a lot of stuff. And creating the War and Peace course was the most exhausting and energizing thing I had ever done at HBS. Uh, I spent a lot of time putting together this course. You had and mentioned the ended, length of some of the cases that oh, are in that course, right? Which is fantastic. Some of you might be on this, uh, on this call, but I told my students on day one, you will read more in this course than you have in any other HBS class. There were cases that were 25, 30,000 words long as opposed to like five to 6,000, which is what a standard case might be. And, and we just had some of the most incredible conversations and drawing out uh, ideas about strategy, negotiation, leadership, and, and other things. In fact, one of the frameworks that sort of comes out of the course is when there's a failure um, historically or, or in current day, um, what we sort of attribute it to has a huge impact on how we decide to correct for it in the future. And one of the things we would struggle with is, was this really a failure of negotiation or a failure of strategy or a failure of leadership? And how do you sort of uh, separate those things? So when the course ended, uh, my plan was to, to spend the next year writing a book on these ideas, a nonfiction book. And uh, right around that time, COVID hit and everything shut down which was, if anything, gonna give me more time to do some writing. But the last meeting I had before the shutdown was with uh, you know, a friend of mine. He's actually, uh, he's an entrepreneur in the, in the Boston area I'm on his board. Uh, his name is Zach. And he just randomly mentioned this sort of kernel of an idea for a fiction book. And he said, this is what your next book should be about. Uh, and, and I thought it was really compelling. I thought it was really interesting, but I said to him, well, listen, I'm not gonna write a fiction book. I have real work to do. Uh, but for the next month, I couldn't get the idea out of my head. And it just grew into something just bigger and broader and, and more interesting and more multidimensional. And the next thing I knew, everything that I had been thinking about and talking about in the War and Peace course, all the work I had been doing over the last many years as an advisor on really difficult negotiations and conflicts and War and Peace situations, and this kernel of a fiction idea just blended together in three months of just writing every night. 
and seeing what happens next. And then it all sort of got woven together. So it's a fiction book and it's meant to be entertaining first and foremost. But a lot of those ideas about history and strategy and negotiation and leadership and diplomacy and really dealing with the most difficult of situations are embedded throughout. And, and that's what the book became. That's interesting, that's interesting. And then if we think about Professor Kilmer, the main protagonist in reading the book, though, those who have read it or those who will, will quickly realize he's a very keen observer of the reality. He's constantly monitoring things around him. He's looking for clues. He's connecting the dots, looking for incongruencies, forming hypotheses. How, how much of that ability do you think is something that is innate, something that's part of people's personality, or something that can be taught? And, and, are, and are you looking to teach people to do that with the book? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. So uh, a lot of what we do at, at HBS or at any business school or any school of any kind uh, is we take as a founding assumption that things can be taught and things can be learned. Otherwise, uh, why would I wouldn't have a job, I suppose. Um, you'd still be okay and, and the rest of the folks here would be fine, but I would be out of a job. So when we think about things like negotiation or strategy or leadership, um, one way to answer the question is effective negotiators, effective strategists, effective leaders, do certain things that ineffective people don't do. And we can figure out what those things are to some degree and educate people on do this, don't do this, cultivate this behavior or this habit and try to you know, overcome this habit of yours. And in a situation like this, try doing it this way. So to the extent that what effective negotiators do or leaders do is behavioral, I think that can be taught. Uh, some people might have the propensity to do it naturally and other people, it might be more of a struggle, but we can, I think, more easily sort of identify some of those behaviors uh, and some of those uh, ways of making decisions or processes for making decisions and then educate people. The harder part is the element that, that you're touching on in this question, which is uh, how do you sort of uh, get people to think differently? Uh, how do you make them more analytical? How do you get them to be better at connecting the dots or, or to see what other people don't see? And I think there, there is also the possibility of getting better at it. Uh, the book hopefully will inspire some of those ideas, will hopefully give some clues as to what one might do to be more able to do those things. But uh, in a sense, what you're, what you're trying to do in that situation is, is develop elements that we all have from curiosity, uh, creativity, uh, courage. I, I think you need to sort of develop those elements that we sometimes think of as being sort of orthogonal to the work we do, but to me, I think are integral to the work we do. I think you need to have that curiosity to see things that other people don't or to see things differently from the way you've always seen them. You have to have the courage to speak up when you think you have a hypothesis or a point of view that maybe challenges the way everybody else has seen things or done things. Creativity, again, comes down to challenging and having some sort of humility that you know maybe the way in which we've done things before isn't really the right way to do it. So perhaps we should try it differently. And I think like any muscle, these are things that can be exercised. And like any habit, I think these are things that can be created. And for those kinds of things, you won't get it from a lecture, but sometimes you will be inspired to do those things. And that's where art, I think, really plays a role because art can inspire in ways that a lecture or our usual pedagogical tools in the classroom just can't do. I can teach you do A, B, C, D, and E in a classroom session. But I think a book like this is better at inspiring people to think differently or to challenge themselves or to think more creatively or to sort of flex those muscles of curiosity and creativity and courage that maybe otherwise are a little bit latent. And so I think that's kind of the, the nice thing about a book like this. It, it just gets at you at a, in a different way. That's interesting because one way of thinking it, I suppose, is the case studies are working to have people put themselves into the shoes of the protagonist and discuss the situation from different perspectives. And mm -hmm. this is the next level of an empathetic understanding of the situation, living through the situation, right, mm -hmm. by, by reading a book or by experiencing a work of fiction. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it gives you the, the, the ideally, what, what these books or a case will do, it'll give you the right amount of being engrossed as if you are that character, right. but the distance you need to see what they maybe aren't seeing or to imagine what might be an alternative possibility. Uh, I did a lot of theater when I was in high school and mm -hmm. uh, as, as actors, one of the things that you, you learn is about this idea of sort of like a second awareness. And that might even have been the phrase, it's been a while now, where 
when you're acting and you're trying to get into a character, when you're trying to get into a role and you have to get emotional, whether it's anger or sadness or joy or whatever it might be, on the one hand, you have to become that character. But that can't be completely right because if you became that character 100%, how would you know what to say next and what your script is and how would you know where to go on the stage? So you have to have that second awareness that, that lies above it. And how the interaction with the audience and the other exactly the other how story. you would lose that if you became 100 percent that character you might just yeah. go nuts um so to speak so that sort of paradox that dichotomy that sort of didactic i think exists anytime we find ourselves in a negotiation uh in a, an organizational setting as a leader you're, you're you're performing you're doing you're you're there but to the extent that you can keep that second awareness, the ability to sort of float above it and sort of see the whole picture without your ego filtering everything you're doing, I think you end up being a little bit more effective. Uh, you don't have to do it in a very, very even uh, conscious, explicit way. But I think that's always there. And I think that can be leveraged. That makes sense. And I guess to distill that down a little, when we're talking about that awareness, we're talking about a, an awareness of the whole playing field all of the players, what they're doing, how they're interacting. And it's mm -hmm. it's that what you're talking about. Is that correct? Yeah. So, you know, when we, uh, again, anybody who's taken a course on negotiation, either with me or presumably with anybody else, uh, at least one of the things that I focus on is the ability to zoom out in, in a lot of different ways. So don't just focus on the substance of the deal and the people that are at the table, right? Zoom out and think not just about the substance, which is the things that we have to sort of put down in a contract or the give and take or the concession, that's the substance of the deal. Effective negotiators sort of zoom out and think also about the process, all right? How do we get from where we are today to the finish line? Beyond just the substantive elements of what we need to agree to. They think about the frame, the psychological frame that has taken hold, that is affecting how each party is looking at the situation and looking at each other. And can that frame be changed, right? So if they're seeing me as weak or desperate, uh, can I change that frame? Because that's going to be an obstacle in this deal or an obstacle in me getting what I want. Uh, they zoom out and look at the people that aren't in the room who can somehow influence the negotiation or are influenced by the negotiation. All of those things are different versions of sort of zooming out and seeing the big picture, not just what's happening at the table in the deal, but all these other elements that in some ways have more of an impact on whether you achieve your objectives or don't. And I think that sometimes gets missed if you're sort of schema or script of negotiation is I walk into the room, I know what I want, and here's the issues we're going to be talking about, and I'm going to do a great job negotiating at the table. I think those are effective skills, but we can teach those in a couple of days. A lot of these other things takes even a lot longer to, to sort of describe, discuss, and, and, and learn. Mm, interesting. So we're talking about uh, curiosity. We're talking about analytics. We're talking about looking at the big picture and zooming out, as you're saying. What else do you think are some of the major tools in a toolbox of a great negotiator? Like people will conclude Professor Kilmer in the Peacemaker's Code is a great negotiator. Yeah, so, you know, um, and I'll, uh, I'll describe something that, that comes out of the course as well. And I think it resonates with the book and it resonates with what makes a great negotiator. One of the things that I feel uh, is a trait that I talked earlier about strategy, negotiation and leadership. One of the things that I think is true for all great strategists, great negotiators, and great leaders, um, I don't mean by great, like historically great, just people in your organization, people in your life that you think are, are very good at these things. Who are successful, think, who are successful in those interactions. That's right. Uh, even in, in a one-off situation, if sure. the, the element that spans all three of these, in my mind, and there may be others as well, but one of the most important ones is empathy. I don't think you can be a great strategist unless you have the ability to empathize and see what the other side is wanting, how they're likely to behave in a certain situation, what uh, motivates them, what their constraints are. The same is true with negotiation. You can't be a, a great negotiator uh, without having empathy and being able to understand the interests, the constraints, the alternatives, the perspective of the other parties that are relevant to the negotiation. And you can't be a great leader. Um, now, again, any one of these roles, you can get lucky, in any one of these roles, if you have enough leverage or power, you might not notice that the lack of empathy uh, was a drain on your ability to succeed. But for most of us, most of the time, if we're going to be successful in each of these, I think cultivating that empathy, the ability to see the world the way other people see it, and to really try to understand what drives people, what constrains people, 
what their perspective is on things gives you a lot of leverage and a lot of power in situations where otherwise you may feel like you are the vulnerable, weaker, weaker party. Uh, that's also a theme that you, you see in the book. Um, the other thing I'll say uh, in terms of sort of effective negotiation, I, uh, for a number of reasons, whether it's advising or consulting on deals in the business world or in pro bono work that I do with governments, tend to find myself in situations where things are very difficult, right? I mean, that's kind of where I, you know, try to try to make a difference. That's why and, that's why they bring you in, right? They couldn't well, figure it out themselves first. Yeah, or in anticipation of something being complex, they might bring me in. And so, but one of the hallmarks, especially on the on the conflict side in, in governments and, and armed conflicts and protracted conflicts, you're not the first person trying to solve this problem. Um, people have come before you and they have been smart and they have been dedicated and they have been well-intentioned uh, and they've had maybe enough resources, but things haven't worked out. These conflicts are still going on or this problem still exists mm -hmm. or this, this dispute still exists. And I think a, a poor way to approach uh, a job like that is to go in and think, you're going to be a better negotiator in some sort of traditional way than they are. And because you're smarter, you're going to get it right. Or because you're going to use the right tactics or say the right words to the right people, that's going to, that's going to sort of unlock the whole thing. These things have been going on for years, sometimes decades, in some cases, centuries. Um, most things have been tried in that way. And so one of the things I push people to do, and one of the things I push myself to do, or I push the person who's asking me for my advice to do, is to, to tell me their theory of the case. Right? What exactly is the reason that you believe things have not worked out in the past? And in my experience, in the really difficult problems we run into in the world, in life, um, whether they're negotiation problems or, or any other problem, it's rarely that it all boils down to, if we had only said this, if we had only done this, if we had only approached it this way in a tactical sort of way. So what I've found to be useful, and we talk about this in the course uh, a little bit uh, as well, is What's changed between the last time people tried and now? And in my, in my sort of framework of it, there's sort of four things you want to look at. Have the conditions changed? Has the scope of the problem changed? Has the frame changed? Or has the process changed? Not only do these things naturally change, but these can be made to change. The conditions weren't right because A, B, C, D, E. So are the conditions different right now? Was the scope maybe not properly um, structured? So we were thinking too narrowly about the, the problem. If we expand the problem, it's gonna be easier to solve or the scope is too wide, we need to narrow it. The process might be the problem, the way in which we sequence things and the way in which we sort of did the things we did. Maybe we, we need a different process. Or the frame, as I said earlier, the way people are looking at it, you know, they were just never gonna make any concessions or they were never gonna move because they're so sure they're gonna win this war. Why would they ever do this? Has the frame shifted in any way? And so if you can't have a theory of the case that says the reason will succeed now, even though many others have tried and failed in the past, and you can't pin it on the conditions have changed or the scope has changed or the process has changed or the framing has changed, well, the last thing you're sort of left with is, okay, we're going to just say and do things differently once we get there. Uh, th that does help. It, it does play a role. But usually you want to think a little bit more broadly and, and have the humility to say that Others who are also smart and well-intentioned have tried and failed, and maybe there's a reason for that. It's not because they're idiots. It's not because they're corrupt. It's not because they're, uh, it, it, it's, it's possibly that the situation is really hard. And now you're going to try to change that situation so you can unlock the deal that was otherwise unlikely to be locked, unlocked. Mm -hmm. Interesting. There is an interesting mix between humility and then a proactivity or the knowledge that one is likely to positively impact the situation, right? So as an example, we, we talked a little bit uh, before about your book called I Moved Your Cheese, mm -hmm. where you talk about who moved my cheese, a business fable that talked about basically can't change much in this big, big, huge world. Just look for where the prize is try to get the prize as much as possible. And then there you're shifting the paradigm and you're saying, you know what? You're responsible for your own personal growth and mm -hmm. your own ability to push the boundaries and impact the environment. So play by your own rules. Mm -hmm. So here we're talking about 
to one degree humility, but to another degree coming into the situation and saying, yes, we think we can ask the questions and we can hopefully find a solution to the problem, i.e. every problem might have a solution. So can you talk about that balance? Because yeah. I, I see the same balance in the Peacemakers Code, right? And Professor yeah. Kilmer approaching it in both uh, a way of humility, but both in a way of, okay, I, I'll actually work with the team, with everybody involved, and I think there must be a way to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the, the, the sort of phrases that Professor Kilmer, the character, is very fond of, then there's a reason for it in the book, is that every problem wants to be solved. Um, it's almost like his mantra. It's like every problem wants to be solved. This is the way he looks at problems, right? Uh, as in don't fight the problem. Don't think it's out there, you know, taunting you or trying to get you to screw up. The problem wants to be solved. It's giving you hints. Uh, there's a solution out there. It wants you to solve it, work with it, sort of embrace it, and then try to, to try to solve it. Um, it's actually something I tell my kids all the time, right? When they're struggling with a math problem uh, or they're struggling with some situation that's just a little bit complex for them, uh, I say, you know, don't get frustrated. You know, don't, don't, don't sort of think as the, the problem as your enemy. Every problem wants to be solved. There's a solution there somewhere. Now, when you, when you approach it that way, you're just like more likely to see things that you're not seeing right now. Um, this sort of, again, uh, this, whether it's a spectrum or, or whether they're orthogonal or whether there's some tension between uh, sort of humility and, and proactivity is, is I think, a, something that I think most people here would, will have experienced and maybe even have their own theories on this. But the way I think about it is, um, and I've said this to my students in the past, which is you need confidence and you need humility. And these are not, uh, there's no tension, exclusive, right? right? They're not, not mutually exclusive, exclusive at all. Uh, they're not even enemies. They're, they're best friends, right. right? If you have a lot of courage, but no humility, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. If you have a lot of humility and no courage, you're not going to do very much. It's when you combine those two things, or humility and proactivity, we're sort of using these constructs now a little bit loosely, but, but roughly right. the same. Uh, it's the same sort of thing. There was, um, I saw this in, in, a, in a movie many years ago where, where this guy says the difference between um, confidence and uh, arrogance Right, and he's and he sort of makes this distinction, and and I don't know whether he's quoting somebody from somewhere else, but I, I heard it in a movie, so I'll, I'll just say it, and I, it really resonated with me. He said, "Confidence is saying I can do this. Arrogance is saying only I can do this. Mm. And I think confidence is what you need. I can do this. This is a solvable problem. It can be solved if we put enough perseverance uh, and patience and creativity and energy and resources and intellect." This is a solvable problem. I think I can solve it. So I'm going to take the steps. I'm going to do what other people say is maybe not doable. But you don't go as far as to say, it's something about me. Only I can solve this. That's arrogance. And that can be blinding. That can be something that, if anything, uh, makes you less likely to see ways forward or to not ask for help when you need it. Uh, I work with a lot of, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurs and early stage company folks. And, and one of the things the boards often complain about is like, we want people that have courage and we want people that have confidence, but when it gets a little too far into arrogance, they don't ask for help when they need it, or they don't bring us in early enough. And I think that same kind of uh, tightrope we need to walk in, in a lot of situations. So you want proactivity, you want confidence, you want, I want to do it, I can do it, but you don't want it to be arrogance because that can then run, you know, uh, Actually, Run them off, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so so there's there's confidence, there's action, there's doing it. And then there's some situations in the negotiation world where it's better not to practice, better not to do it. Mm -hmm. And so not here we're not talking about confidence and humility anymore. Here we're talking about perhaps conscious choices or understanding situations. So what are some some cases in which it's better to actually just take a step back? Yeah. And maybe so, that's the action, right? Maybe you're proacting by yeah. not taking action. Uh, that's right. So, you know, um, the way I think about it is, and again, uh, the way I teach negotiations is, uh, there's no tactic that's always a good tactic. Right. There's no thing that you can say or do where there isn't a situation where I wouldn't do it. So what you don't want to do is fall in love with or memorize a whole bunch of tactics. Because truly, there's an infinite number of tactics. Like in negotiations, literally, there are an infinite number of tactics. Why? I can make you one offer or two or nine or 10. I could lean forward or I could lean back or I could lean forward for a while, then lean back. I and could walk up and how leave. they respond to you and one versus the other, right? Yeah, so, so 
the same thing with proactivity or, or making a, you know making an offer or, or taking control of the agenda or anything proactive. The key isn't that proactivity works. Sort of well above the level of tactic, tactics is the level of principles. What I try to teach people is understand the principles. Those are generalizable. If you understand those principles, principles like you know, the, the power of empathy or having a learning mindset, uh, the, the principle of sort of negotiating process before you negotiate substance, uh, principles about, you know, seeing the entire negotiation space, seeing all the parties that are relevant, uh, principles of uh, framing. Um, those principles, when married to your understanding of the situation you're in right now, is what should result in the tactics that make sense today. So there are lots of situations where doing nothing is actually the right call because the principle that's guiding you at that point is not that, you know, I need to frame it a certain way and the way I'll do it is like, well, wait, if I want to frame the situation as I'm the one in power, sometimes given the situation, you do that by speaking. Sometimes you show power by not being the one who speaks or calls or, or reaches out. So it's not the tactic. The tactic is just in service of that principle. Another reason you might not be as proactive is because you're not worried about framing as much as you are about learning, right? And you want the other side to be the one speaking. You're trying to understand the situation. Now, there may be some proactivity involved in terms of the questions you ask, uh, rather than letting them talk about whatever they wanna talk about, you might be guiding that conversation. So now there's a blend of proactivity and reactivity. So, but all of those sort of subtle things, I could never teach my students or my clients, here's the million tactical, uh, manifestations that you need to remember. So when the right situation comes, you do this. No, we use those as examples. We use cases as examples. We use anecdotes as examples, but then we draw out the principles. And the hope is that the better you understand why and how those principles work, when you're in a situation, you can figure out which tactic that principle spits out given the nuances and idiosyncrasies of the situation you're in right now because you never wanna copy and paste tactics ever, ever. What you want to do is understand the principles and apply those. Interesting. And we talked uh, a bunch about empathy. We talked a bunch about understanding uh, other parties, not specific tactics, but what are the principles of understanding another party? Like let's say Professor Kilmer, he's trying to understand a counterparty that is yeah. quite different than, than many that he's faced before mm -hmm. in, in a game of global proportions. So what are some of the principles of understanding who you're dealing with and what what it is that they represent and how to negotiate with them. Yeah, and, and this is one of those things where there's gonna be some maybe tangible things, but also sort of inspirational things in the book about like just the, the way in which this character just does not let up and, and the perseverance required when you're hitting your head against the wall, you're in truly the no-win situation. Uh, how do you continue to, to move forward and trying to understand and unlock the situation? Uh, I think that that can be sort of an inspirational, motivational piece of it. But certainly there are uh, more tactical, tangible things that I think people can carry with them that makes it a little bit more likely that they learn the things that they need to learn about the other side. So just as an example, um, I don't care to know everything about Boris when I'm negotiating with Boris. I mean, do I care what your favorite color is? I mean, unless we're negotiating like the sale of a shirt or something, probably is not right, relevant. Right. Um, so how do you decide what is worth focusing on and what isn't worth focusing on? And, and the framework that I use and the one that I think, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't go in and say, okay, let's, let's put these four things down and list all of these things. But these are the four things that guide my negotiating approach, I should say. I want to understand the other side's interests, their constraints, their alternatives, and their perspectives. So in, in the book, uh, Negotiating the Impossible, I sort of talk about this ICAP analysis, ICAP, interest, constraints, alternatives, perspective. Interests, what do they care about? What do they not care about? What do they care about more? What do they care about less? What truly drives them? Not just what are they interested in right now, but what's really driving them? What keeps them up at night? Um, why are they here today? So I try to understand their interests. And this is when we ask a lot of whys, right? What do we get to when we ask why, That's why, right. why, why, why? Asking so why, understanding the background. So at the table, it's about asking why and trying to figure out what they want, but even just broadly. I need to understand their interests and, and, and maybe asking why isn't going to help because they're not going to tell us anything. In fact, they're not even at the table. I mean, but we still need to understand or deduce their interests. And there's maybe different ways of doing it depending on the situation. Constraints. What are the things they can and cannot do? Where do they have more flexibility? Where do they have less flexibility? Uh, there'll be certain things in a negotiation which you are sure you deserve, 
which you believe are rightfully yours, which you will not get simply because their hands are really tied. And the sooner you understand that, the more likely you structure the deal or the process in a way that allows you to achieve your objectives while still respecting their genuine constraints. So interest constraints. Third thing, alternatives. What are their alternatives to this negotiation or this deal? How else could they solve their problems? Are their alternatives getting better as time goes on or worse as time goes on? Right? So that might change the timing of how and when you negotiate. And finally, their perspective. How do they see the world? How do they see me? What is the frame within which they're looking at the situation? Um, is this a big deal to them or a small deal to them? Um, again, there's no right or wrong answer or even a better or worse answer. Uh, in some cases, the best thing that can happen to you as a negotiator is that you're negotiating with someone for whom this is a really big deal. In other situations, the worst thing that can happen to you is you're negotiating with someone for whom this is a really big deal. So the key is to understand those things. So for me, when I'm trying to understand, whether it's through asking questions, which is just one vertical, but my entire approach, the design of that process, the structure, the approach to dealing with the situation or banging my head against the wall, whatever it might be, interests, constraints, alternatives, and perspectives. And the better I understand those, the more likely, no guarantees, the more likely I find a way forward that allows me to achieve my objectives and often in doing so, helping them achieve theirs as well. Although not, they're not always, you know, so. They're always so, interlinked, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Makes sense. Makes sense. Now in terms of dealing with different parties. So here, here we've, we've gotten into understanding them from, from different angles and not necessarily everything is required. Everything is needed about what is relevant and what makes sense in the custom situation. What if we add an international perspective? So uh, Professor Kilmer is an American. He's dealing with, he's working with Professor Whitman, who is the first U.S. woman president. We quickly learn about President Sokolov, uh, P.M. Atal. We learn about President Zhao. What are your views on cultural differences or nuances in negotiation? How, how do you address this for negotiation success? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll leverage what I said earlier about principles versus tactics. Um, tactics that seem to work in one environment will often not work in a, cult, a different culture. Um, what generalizes much easier are the principles. In fact, the principles we teach are, are principles very much because they're generalizable. So, and by the way, when I use the word culture, I don't just mean country culture. Uh, even two different industries within the same country can have very, very different cultures or norms about what's appropriate or inappropriate when you're negotiating. Um, you know, I see people here from, from all over the world. You can think in your own country, you know, whether you're negotiating a tech deal or a land deal, sort of uh, new economy versus old economy, whether you're in a city or in a village, there, there's a lot of differences in the ways in which people negotiate. Uh, in some cultures, if you walk in and you sort of make a very aggressive offer and you sort of justify it and you anchor aggressively, as we say in negotiations, uh, and then later you sort of moderate your demands a lot, in some cultures, they're going to think you're a liar, whether you ever lied or not. In other cultures, they expect you to be very aggressive and there to be a lot of movement as you go forward. So the tactic uh, is very dangerous to take from one culture, even one company to another uh, as a leader. Uh, you need to understand the situation you're in. So what worked in one situation may not work in another culture, in another environment. But you have to ask yourself, what was I trying to do that for? What problem was I trying to solve? What are the underlying principles? So I don't care whether you're in the US or any other country or any other industry, uh, having a learning mindset and understanding their interests and constraints, that's just important. Um, asking and getting at the why rather than the what is always important. Controlling the frame or influencing the frame is always important. Thinking about process, not just about substance, is always important. Zooming out and seeing all the players is always important. And now how you do that tactically will vary. You know, making an opening offer always anchors the discussion. But that doesn't mean you can do it in the first five minutes in every culture or in the first day. When you make your offer and how you make it will vary across cultures. But you still need to understand the power of doing so. Right. And then and then you adjust based on your understanding of the situation. Makes sense. Makes sense. OK, so, so then we've talked about effectively the space, i.e. different different potentially countries, different parts of the same industry, different, maybe even personal cultures. Right. How people uh, view themselves and their values. What about in time? When we talk about and there's discussion about that in the book, too. What about taking historical precedent? 
and yeah. using that precedent. So one, one of the points that is made in, uh, in the book by Professor Kilmer is effectively Germany, right? Yeah. And World War, but which World War? World War yeah. One or World War Two? In That's World a good War question. II, yeah, so you have, you have a situation where perhaps the Allies didn't act fast enough and strongly enough versus in World, World War I, the case might be made that it's the other way around, that the yeah. response was too harsh and the result led to a lot of death and prolonged wars. What do you think about historical precedents? And, how, yeah. and when are they useful? Are they just completely not? And it's what is the custom situation that people are dealing with? Yeah, it, it's a good question. It's actually a, a really good question. I mean, I, I noticed right at the time we're going to switch to the, the audience right. as well, and it's a good transition. And there are some good guys. questions on historical situations yeah. too, which I think will lead us well into some yeah, of those. Exactly. Uh, so, um, you know, one of the things that, that people often do is they learn from experience, their own experiences and the experiences that they've heard about. Uh, the problem, of course, is when you're walking around and policymakers, unfortunately, do this a little too often, and leaders of countries do this too often, is they sort of have one or two or three salient examples from history from which they have extracted some lesson. But most of the lessons, unless they've sort of carefully thought those through, are really more like punchlines than real principles. And so the example is you brought up, right, if you sort of have studied World War I, and one of the lessons you've extracted from it, that if you're overly aggressive early on, uh, when there's tensions, you might end up in a war that could have been avoided. If you take that lesson and apply it into the next situation, well, uh, the lesson of World War II, somebody who studied that will say, no, 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 it's the exact opposite. It's early aggression that actually preempts and, and stops wars from happening. So which of those is right, right? Or think about things like regime change, right? If you're thinking about entering Iraq and your model for regime change is what happened after World War II, when the US entered Germany and Japan, and you think of those as successes, well, that might lead you to a certain decision in Iraq. Whereas if your model is Vietnam, uh, you might come up with a very different um, proposal. And again, the problem is when you walk around understanding history either too narrowly, as in you just don't have enough data and you haven't looked at enough competing alternative storylines, narratives, examples, or your understanding is too shallow. Like you sort of have this punchline view of, oh, the lesson of World War II is X. No, that's probably not it. It's, it's much more nuanced. If you really know what happened behind the scenes as to why Chamberlain did what he did and what the context was, you would not simply walk around yelling appeasement bad, appeasement bad. You would have a much sort of nuanced view of what appeasement even means and why the country did what it did and how much of it was a leadership versus negotiation versus a strategy failure. So what I advise... And when I can't advise somebody to do it, what I try to bring to the table is a deeper and broader understanding of historical analogies, which will never spit out the right answer, but will help us think more carefully about what to do in this situation. Given what we know, is today's situation more like A, more like B, or none of the above, or a little of each, and what else can we bring to it? And that's where analogies can be helpful as opposed to hurtful. Understand, understand, that sounds great. Well, question on history is which figures in history helped guide you with the plot and negotiation issues? Did you consider Churchill, Kissinger, or more modern issues like issues in the Middle East and the U.S. modern issues? Yeah, so um, yeah. in both the Peacemaker's Code and the War and Peace book, uh, it, it's, it's uh, a much longer history than any of those specifics that were just mentioned, although some contemporaries are also considered. Um, you know, the, the War and Peace Corps starts with the Peloponnesian War, and then we do a lot of stuff on World War I and World War II. And although there are elements where we focus on very specific individuals, like we do something on the Cuban Missile Crisis, and of course that ends up highlighting uh, JFK and others that were specifically involved in Khrushchev and others. Um, but it, it's not so much uh, an approach which says, here's the Kissinger approach, which I personally have some issues with, but, uh, you know, or this, because I think you can learn from literally every individual, whether you like them or not, whether they did something right or wrong in your views. Um, but you usually only learn from all of these characters or all these events if you see them in the context in which they happened, right? So I'm not a huge fan of, of hyper-revisionism where you sort of judge everything based on what we know today or how we feel today or what our views and values are today, because, Otherwise, everything we're doing today will also be wrong because in the future, most of these things will look sort of 
bizarre. So, so if you can, and that's what the idea of the book and what this character tries to do is to really try to understand, understand from the context of what is real and practical when you're in that situation, what are your options? What do you know? What do you not know? How then can you behave best? And when you fail to, what stood in the way? That's the driving question. Why did they make the mistakes they did? Or why did they do something that we think in retrospect worked out well? Uh, and the last thing I'll say on this is there's a huge danger of outcome bias. Uh, outcome bias, for anybody who's either studied psychology or behavioral economics or, or likes to read those kinds of uh, books and, and research, outcome bias basically says that when things worked out well, we assume that the input was the right one or the decision was right. And when things work out bad, we overly assume that the decision was, was wrong. But every decision has a combination of both what you put into it and, and the decision you made and, and factors you couldn't have controlled and luck and all these things. And so the mistake we make is to blindly do what worked before. Uh, and that's what often happens when I'm talking to people in, in the policy world uh, and people that have been in a specific war or they have deep memories of something that, here's what worked, so let's do it. Their experiences yeah. Yeah. Or here's what didn't work, so let's do the opposite of it. And neither of those is an effective way to make decisions. Uh, that's that's falling prey to the outcome bias. Now, I know why politically you might have to do some of those things, right? It worked before, so we can justify it now. Or it didn't work before, so we wouldn't be able to justify it now, so let's not do it. But that's politics. That's not effective policy. And so my job, again, understanding their political constraints, is often to help them understand that simply because something worked or didn't work is not the reason to do it or not do it. Interesting. Okay, thank you. And thanks, by the way, to Alexander Chandler for this question. The next question is from Kristen, uh, who is asking, what are the tactics to reframe the position if somebody perceives you to be weak? Mm -hmm. How to look bigger? How to reframe this weakness to your advantage? By talking about successes? What, what are some, some of the ideas yeah. for that, Deepak? You look bigger by doing this. <laughs> yes. uh, it's a tactic. Uh, it probably won't work. Um, so the question always comes down to, why do you look weak, right? So before I solve how you should look strong, I need to figure out why specifically you look weak. If the reason is because in the last few times, every time, let's say you're negotiating a deal, and every single time they've asked for a change in the deal or a delay in uh, when the deal is going to be signed, uh, you've always just said yes. You've never pushed back. You've never challenged it. You've never asked for a compromise in return or a concession in return. And if that's why they think you're weak, well, the, the, the way to respond to it might be to sort of push back a little bit. Now, you'd want to do it in general. Frames get set early, and the longer they've been set, the harder they are to change. The longer someone's views have sort of uh, uh, become frozen, the, the harder it's going to be to, to shape them. But then a more drastic action perhaps is required, right. either gradual or more drastic, right? That's right. So the sooner you challenge a frame, the, the less risky things you may need to do. Right. The longer somebody's been thinking that, hey, when we say jump, you're going to say how high, the more likely it is that when you push back, it's going to be a little bit more jarring for all parties. You're going to have to do something a little bit more aggressive, which of course comes with its uh, attendant risks. But you could be considered weak for some other reason. Maybe everybody that they've ever negotiated with that looks like you. Maybe it's race or gender. Maybe it's which kind of company you are. Maybe they're a big company or a small company. It could be for any other reason. If that's the reason they're carrying this sort of model that you're weak and they're strong, well, that wouldn't necessarily come down to challenging them on certain things, although it might. It might be to sort of convey to them in however you want, it, it depends on the situation, why you don't fit that mold, what makes you different, or how you yourself very strongly believe in the value you bring to the table. Uh, in other cases, it might be situations where you have to, um, as, as the, I think the questioner or maybe you mentioned, is, is bring in data that supports the contention that, that you're not weak. Uh, sometimes it's being willing to walk away. Uh, sometimes that's the right move. And, and sometimes it's to let people know, hey, shop it around. If you think that this is uh, that what we're offering isn't good enough, shop it around, let the market speak, and let's negotiate again in the future. Uh, of course, in those situations, you also want to make sure you give the other side a face-saving way of coming back because they also don't want to sort of go around and come back and say, yeah, you were right, we got nothing better. So the general answer is there's too many ways not all of them will be effective, but there's too many ways to answer that question, but they all start with, if I was advising the person myself, would say, why exactly do they see that you're weak? And then let's sort of unravel that to the extent that we can. Makes sense, makes sense, sounds good. In terms of the strengths of statements and in terms of the 
lack of, let's say, an ultimatum, which I think you alluded to. There's a question from YouTube Live from Michael Bannon, and he is asking, when they say something publicly, they're potentially committed to it. Not quite an ultimatum, but if they said it, it's there, it's on the record. So if they hadn't said it, maybe they're not committed to it. How do you balance that in drawing out the learnings in the understanding the situation versus when you're trying to understand the situation, you put out the information, you get information back, you get trapped in the information you got back. You thought it was for your learnings, but they've established their position. Yeah, uh, if I can unwrap that in the way that I can sort of best understand it. So, yes. uh, you know, you, you can imagine a world where, uh, you, you know, if you ask them like, you know, what will it take to get the deal, right? And you just, you're just curious, right? And now they say, it will take a gazillion dollars. Right. Now, if you had not asked and they hadn't said it, maybe they would have been willing to do it for a million dollars, but now they've gone ahead and answered your question in an aggressive way. So, so what do you do about it, right? So uh, how do you sort of, is that uh, one version of the question? Yep, yep, yep that's right. So I'll, I'll give, because uh, this happens whether you ask a question or not, to the, the early part of this question. Sometimes people just say stuff and they make an ultimatum and now it's a thing, right? I have sort of two ways of dealing with ultimatums. Um, I have probably many others, but sort of two broad ways that, that come to mind. If somebody makes an ultimatum to me, either it's sort of like an absolute statement with a fist to the table kind of an ultimatum, or it's just something that they've said that might be hard for them to take back later, just because they've said it. If somebody makes an ultimatum to me, which I sort of define as any absolute statement, no wiggle room, this is, this is what they're saying. My first strategy is to simply ignore it. And what I mean by that is, I don't ask people to explain it further. I don't ask them to repeat what they said. I ignore it. And the reason I'll ignore it, I'll just move on. I'll address everything else except that ultimatum. I'll talk about all the other aspects of what we're discussing. I won't focus on the ultimatum. And the reason is, a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, they may come to the realization that what they said they must have, or what they said uh, is a deal breaker for them, uh, is actually no longer a deal breaker. What they said they must have, they can live without. Or what they demanded is something that they now know is going to stand in the way of a deal. And when that realization comes, when that day comes, the last thing I want them to remember is having said, I will never do this, or you must do this. Because on that day, that will become the barrier. So I want to sort of diffuse the, the salience of that to them and to me, and I don't want it to, to dig a deeper hole, so to speak. The alternative, because sometimes you can't ignore what the other side says, right? If somebody says something, it's the only thing they said. You can't be like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Like, yeah. Somebody says, we will never do this, right? We can never accept X, or you must do this. What I'm likely to do in that engagement is to reframe their ultimatum in a way that respects what they've been saying, but reframes it as a non-ultimatum. So, so for example, if somebody says, uh, we can never agree to act, so we'll never do this. I might say something like, hey, listen, I understand given where things are today, this would be really hard for you to do. I totally get that. So why don't we dot, 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 dot. And what I'm doing there is sort of two things. One, they said, we can never do this. And I responded by saying, hey, listen, I understand. Okay, I understand. Given where things are today. So that's the first out. Right. Because as the geo changes, as, as the time changes, as you're giving them a condition they didn't even name. Yeah. So you're, I'm not building any conditions into their offer. Yeah. Right. Given where things are today, this would be really hard for you to do. I get that rather than this is impossible and I accept that. So now it's really hard. I'm not going to fight you for it. And, and at that moment, I think what they really need is you not pushing for something that they don't want to or are not ready to give you or are uncomfortable or are worried about giving you. So the fact that you're not fighting that fight that day. Um, and just letting them escalate further into their ultimatum can sometimes create openings farther down. And then, of course, there's lots of ways in which you might or might not approach it going forward. But ignoring the ultimatum, not fueling it and or reframing it is sometimes one way to get people to, at a later date, be able to self-justify why they didn't follow through on something that at some point it sounded like they would have to follow through on. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. And then there's there's some questions regarding the current existing political conflicts in the world. There's discussion specifically about the Israeli-Palestine conflict. But if yeah, we, we have three away, minutes, we can totally solve that. Yeah, I know, exactly, let's do it. Yeah. So without going into the specifics yeah. of the Israeli-Palestine conflict, perhaps, but talking about conflicts that are in general that seem to be 
intractable for a very long period of time yeah. and the people are just at what seems like a bit of a stalemate what yeah. would need to change in those kinds of situations you think broadly speaking uh so let me just say two things and there this could itself be like a day long sort of, of chat or uh, as, of course, you, course right when you are of course, course. Exactly. Of course, like War and Peace, The Lessons of History, right. for example. Um, so uh, my good friend, Jonathan Powell, who was um, the chief British negotiator for uh, Northern Ireland uh, on the Northern Ireland Peace Agreement, and he was the uh, chief of staff to Tony Blair for like 10 or 11 years. Uh, he, he's fond of saying something, uh, which, which I quite like. He says, you know, every conflict uh, seems impossible or unsolvable until one day it gets solved and then it looks inevitable that it would have been solved, right? Because once it happened, like, of course they figured it out, but this is different, right? Right, and it's Every been gradually things, boiling right? down towards the yeah. solution, gradually chipping away. Yeah. It should have happened in 10 years, yeah. right? So it, it looks impossible, 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 and right. suddenly one day it switches to inevitable. And and there, there's a lot of truth to that. And, and, I, and, I, and I buy that line because I think that uh, every one of those things that we're looking at today that seem un unsolvable, these are conflicts that have been created by human beings and I think human beings can solve them. That does not mean the right idea today would solve it tomorrow. It's just not how it works, but, but, but these are solvable. Um, now, one of the elements that I think is often missing in, in that's more generalizable than just, uh, you know, uh, Arab-Israeli or Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, which I don't think gets enough notice and again, sort of zoom out and think, is it a negotiation mistake, a strategy mistake, or a leadership mistake? Uh, I think one of the things that's often lacking is the moral courage uh, among the leaders that, that end up getting elected, selected, chosen, emergent, whatever it might be. Because, you know, uh, we define leadership in, in our course as sort of a, a set of challenges, right? And one of the most important challenges for a leader is to, to have and display moral courage, uh, to do what needs to be done despite pressures and constraints and, and all these things. And... I think conditions might be wrong, the scope might be improperly chosen, the process might have been mishandled, the framing might be all wrong. All of those are reasons why deals have not happened in the past that would we think create value. Um, that's why when you walk in as a negotiation advisor, you sort of audit the conditions, the scope, the process and the frame, not just the tactics. So all of that still holds true. So I still go back to that, you need to do that audit and then see which of those things you can change or are naturally changing in the right direction to guide you on when and how you might approach the problem. But alongside all of that, you need leaders in these kinds of conflicts that, that have and display moral courage. And um, is it possible to get a deal without that? I suppose, but you still need some, some level of that because, um, you know, peacemakers don't get rewarded enough. Um, you know, war makers get rewarded a little too much. And so the incentive alignment problem constantly exists. Um, you know, and, and, and people that make peace, they often get killed and they don't even get killed by their enemies. They get killed by their, their former brothers in arms who think and that they've they sold out. if they make peace fast enough, nobody knows about it. Yeah, right, exactly. So all, and, and that's another, that's a great point. Uh, let's not think of human history as a series of wars. Uh, we, we can, and, and certainly that's fine if, if one wants to, but human history is also about countless wars that were avoided and that never took place um, and things that were handled well. Now, no one can know. I certainly don't know uh, where we are on the spectrum of, of what the, the total possibilities would have been. And are we, are we an A, a B, a C, a D, or an E? Uh, although the book has some interesting thoughts on that. Um, the Peacemaker's Code does. So, you know, I think we need to do the, the analysis that we talked about earlier, but I think the moral courage piece. And I think as citizens, as, as people who often have a hand in who gets uh, elected or who's in power and, and who gets rewarded for being there. I think if we did a better job also of, of picking people on moral courage, uh, not just guts, moral courage, uh, to do the right thing, even though it's not gonna be rewarded, that, that I think would be uh, helpful. Makes sense, makes sense. Thank you, Deepak. And everybody, we are at the hour. Deepak, would you have a little bit more time? We have a, a lot of questions that have come in. Sure, I'll, I'll hang out for a little while longer. And anybody who needs to go, of course, everybody's busy. So that's great. I just want to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, even as, as we start, uh, the number starts to dwindle. It's great talking to you, Boris. We'll continue talking for a little while longer. 
Uh, the reason I agreed to do this is one, of course, I'm excited about the Peacemakers Code, the book, but also because it's an HBS event and it's an opportunity to talk to people that have that affiliation uh, that I do, which is part of the HBS family. So uh, I hope it was valuable and uh, feel free to reach out and shoot me an email uh, about this conversation or if you end up reading the book, your reactions to the book.